So last time we discussed waves on a string and uh, standing waves on a string. This time we're going to focus on sound energy. Now, we had a relationship for the speed of waves on a string as well. So just to quickly recap, amongst a bunch of general wave properties, this relationship here, tension force over linear density square root is the speed, that applied specifically to a string. And then we had a wavelength relationship for the um, the wavelength of the nth harmonic. Then there were a bunch of general wave properties, you know, like lambda f is v, and then like period is reciprocal frequency is 2 pi over omega. So this time we're going to develop some relationships that apply to sound waves. So first of all, uh, for speed, um, we're just going to focus our attention on the air, and the speed of sound varies with the temperature of the air, and in meters per second, um, it's 331 meters per second plus 0.6 times the centigrade temperature of the air. Now we can create standing sound waves, that's really what musical instruments are all about, and where you have an open end, uh, that will be an antinode. So at an open end, the molecules are free to vibrate and we will get an antinode. So if this is a flute, then this is an open end here, uh, so that's an antinode. And so the air molecules uh, vibrate back and forth quite a bit. And then um, here's another open end. So that'll be another antinode there. And in between those two antinodes, there must be a nodal point where the air molecules aren't moving back and forth very much. Now, with sound, the vibration's this way. But it's helpful for us just to, to visualize um, a sort of equivalent transverse wave like we saw last time on the string, that would look like this. Because then we can see here easily that there's half a wave between the two ends of that instrument. And that's in the fundamental mode. <clears throat> you can have a closed open or a colopen um, instrument. And then at this fixed end, that will be a node. And then up here at the open end, um, the air molecules will be moving a lot. And that'll be an antinode. So again, with sort of the transverse wave model, that would look like this. And that's actually, between node and antinode, that's a quarter of a wavelength. You can also uh, get an instrument with both ends closed. And so the closed ends would be nodes. There'd be a node there and a node there. And then there in between, there'd be an antinode with lots of air molecule motion. Uh, the transverse wave model, oh, it's kind of hard to draw, but sort of look like that. And we'd have a half wave there pattern between the two nodes. Now we expect, because closed close, as I just draw, it just looks totally like a string, nodes at the ends, we expect that'll have the same wavelength relationship. So we expect lambda n is 2L over n for closed closed, just like for the string. Now, what if um, it's open at both ends? Well, if it's open at both ends, these will both be antinodes. And so in sort of the transverse model, there'd be a node in between. So it would look like this. And that's half a wave. So the wood derivation that we did last time is, okay, the length of that instrument is half a wave. So you rearrange and solve for lambda the wavelength of the first harmonic will be 2L over 1. So this is uh, antinode, node, antinode. So <clears throat> the next higher harmonic will have two nodes. And so drawing just the transverse wave model here. Sorry, I should draw it like that. You see that now there's actually a full wave pattern there. So the length of this instrument is a full wave. So the second harmonic is well, just L, but we can write that as 2L over 2. Then the next higher harmonic, there'd be three nodes here with antinodes in between. And so now we've got, there's a full wave, and then there's another half. So that's one and a half wavelengths, or three over two wavelengths. So the wavelength of the third harmonic is 2L over 3, we see that an open open tube has exactly the same relationship 
2L over N that a closed closed to does, same as a string as well. So we conclude for closed closed or open open, the wavelength of the nth harmonic is just 2L over N, where N is the harmonic number. So 1, 2, 3, an integer number. Uh, now let's go back and look at a closed open tube though. Um, we said the fixed end will be a node, this will be an anti-node. This is a little different because now in the length of this instrument, we just have a quarter of a wave. So cross multiplying and solving for the wavelength of the first harmonic, we get 4L over 1. We add another node, so we get node to node to anti-node, and now we have, because a full wave would, would come out back up here, we actually have three quarters of a wave. So when we cross multiply, the wavelength of this harmonic is 4L over 3. So that's a slightly different progression than the other two cases we considered. So now here we'll have three evenly spaced nodes. Let's space them evenly. Node, node, node. So there's a full wave and then there's another quarter wave right there and then there's another quarter. So that's one and a quarter or five-fourths of a wave. So when we cross multiply and solve for the wavelength of this harmonic we get 4L over 5. So <clears throat> we see that for the um, closed open tube that the easiest way to proceed is just to say that okay we've got the first harmonic and then the next higher one is the third harmonic, and the next higher one is the fifth harmonic. And so for this tube, we only use odd numbers. And then the relationship is 4L over N. But for here, we only use 1, 3, 5, etc. Just the odd numbers. So this is the Wavelength relationship for standing sound waves, for sound harmonics. And that's our first topic in sound. Our next topic is related to the pressure uh, and the intensity and loudness of sound. Now, sound's actually a traveling pressure wave. There's regions of normal air pressure, and then something will push and pull on the air and will create regions of low pressure and regions of high pressure. Pushing and pulling repeatedly on the air creates this variation. So we've got, sorry, I'll just draw a line here. We've got some baseline, whoops, some baseline pressure here. Let's try that again. There we go. That's what I was looking for. And then the air pressure varies above and below that. So here it's normal. That's what I want. And then it's normal here, and normal here, and normal here. But then in between, this is a little bit low. So there's our, those air molecules have been pulled apart a little bit, slightly further apart, slightly lower pressure. Here, there's a region of high pressure. Here's a region of low pressure. High back to normal. So now it looks like a wave. <clears throat> and so the pressure actually travels this disturbance travels through space because these air molecules are pushed closer together so they push on their neighbors so that means then that the high pressure zone is traveled over to this point so this is a traveling wave so we expect something like cos kx minus omega t and there will be an amplitude for that wave now that amplitude is actually um, this is position mm -hmm. that amplitude is actually how much the pressure goes up and down so there it is right there and of course, we're dealing with fluctuations around atmospheric pressure. Now, atmospheric pressure is 101,000 pascals. The pressure variation, it turns out to be, you know, single pascals or tens or hundreds of pascals. So it's not particularly big. Now, <clears throat> we would like to know, or we expect rather, that that pressure variation is related to the loudness or the intensity of the sound. And we expect it also has to do with how much the air molecules are moving back and forth. 
So we expect that a large intensity, sorry, a large amplitude, lots of moving back and forth means the sound is intense and loud and there's lots of pressure fluctuation. We expect that when the amplitude's small, we have a small intensity and a smaller pressure variation. And we're just going to derive some physics relationships that say exactly that. It's a bit of a derivation. We're going to show later that this is an expression for elastic energy. It depends on how much the elastic material, the rate at which it's vibrating, what the mass of the elastic material is, and then the distance that it's vibrating back and forth. Now, intensity will be defined here. We used it earlier in sort of a vague sense. But intensity in physics is a ratio of power to area. And I'm going to write out area just in text because A is also going to be amplitude, so there'll be way too many A's floating around. And we'll come up with a better relationship later that we'll box. But for now, we can just say, okay, it's a power over an area. Now, a power is an energy over time. That's the definition of power. Divided by an area. So that's intensity. Now, by energy, it's going to be the energy of the vibrating air back and forth. Again, we're still dividing this by an area. Now, what area are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the cross-sectional area of the air that's actually vibrating. So, a little derivation here. Um, the volume of that air is going to be the base area times the distance. But the distance here, let's imagine, here's this, this air. This is where the pressure wave is traveling. So, there's an area here. And then there's a distance here that will just be speed times time. So that volume is going to be A times the speed times the time. So that's volume. Um, <clears throat> but of course, um, we can say that mass is density times volume. And so we can put in this expression that we have for volume, rho A. Now, the reason that's important is that the potential energy of the vibrating air depends on the mass, so I can now substitute that in. So working out the intensity then, so I'm going to sub in this expression, so it's a half times the rate of vibration squared times the mass, so I'll put this in for mass, rho A, I should write area, I'm sorry, let me put this in as area, because remember I wanted to use area instead of writing A for amplitude. So this is area now, having made that change. Um, da, 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 okay, times V times T. So that's the expression for mass. That's what I worked out of here. So that was mass. And I'm not yet done with the elastic energy because it also depends on the amplitude squared. And then I've got to divide that all by time. And then I've got to divide that all by area. So we see that the cross-sectional area just cancels out. And that's good because it would be pretty hard to measure. Um, and time also cancels out too. Let's do my cancelling in red. That's good, because that would be hard to measure. And so we end up with an expression for the intensity of the sound wave energy. So it's one half, depends on the density of the air. It depends on um, the rate of vibration for the sound wave, the amplitude, and it depends on how quickly that sound wave is traveling through the air. Now that's a pretty complicated derivation, but what it shows is that if the amplitude increases, if the air molecules are moving more, then the sound is more intense. And that's kind of what we expected, right? We want a relationship that says that, because that's just common sense that that would be the case. So we've got that first relationship that we were looking for, the connection between how much the air molecules are moving and how intense the sound is. We want another relationship that connects it to the pressure variation. Well, we'll proceed dimensionally, just for change. We know that pressure is a ratio of force to area. Now, I'm just going to rearrange that a little bit and come up with something that's similar. Okay, so I'm going to write it as kilograms per cubic meter times meters times meters per second times rads per second because you see a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And then if I were to cancel off this and this, I would have per meter squared. So the kilogram meter per second squared, that's the Newton part. 
and then the meter squared is what I needed right there. So a newton per square meter is equivalent to a kilogram per cubic meter times a meter times a meter per second times a rad per second. Notice that rad is dimensionless. Rad, sorry, rad actually means meters over meters. So meters times rads is just meters. Rad is just a placeholder. Now the reason why I bothered writing it this way is just that this is a unit now of density. This is a unit of distance or amplitude. This is a unit of speed. And then this is the unit of rate of vibration. And so a pressure then, we conclude, by dimensionality, a pressure would be a density times an amplitude times a speed times a rate of vibration. There's other ways of deriving it that take longer. But this gets us quite quickly to the result that we wanted, which again shows us that with more air molecule motion, you get a bigger pressure amplitude. There's more of a pressure fluctuation in the sound wave, and it's louder. So that's the microscopic result that we wanted. So we pause to summarize for a moment, and what we've got is, first of all, the standing wave relationship for open, open, closed, closed tubes, and then for open, closed. Remember here, we only use the odd values of n. Here we use all values of n. Then we've just derived We've introduced this new quantity called sound intensity. We've said that it's related to the loudness. And now, through, this der through a derivation, we related it to how much the air molecules move back and forth, the amplitude. And we also related the amplitude to the pressure fluctuation. And then we said speed of sound, and then all those other wave properties also apply to sound waves. So uh, here's a very simple example. We'll do that one in class. And then this point, I think we'll pause. So yes, we'll cover those examples in class. Um, and for now, let's finally write down the intensity formula in a, in a slightly better form. We said that um, intensity was power over area. If you have a point source of sound, say like your finger snapping, then the sound wave energy will spread away in all directions over the surface of a sphere in three dimensions. So the surface area of that sphere surface of the sphere, not particularly well drawn. It's not that easy with this pen. And I'm not the best artist at the best of times. So the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. And so by writing it this way, we get around using a for area. And this is a good relationship to, to write down. OK, so the intensity of sound. We can see that um, it depends on the power. So that's the, the energy coming out of the source of sound. And then it depends on how far you are away from that source of sound, because as you get further away, the sound wave energy spread out more, and therefore it's less intense, less loud. So the total energy and power of the entire sound wave are the same, but um, the sound will become less intense because of the larger area. So because it's inverse variation, we can answer this question fairly easily. Let's say you've you got a source of sound, and you're five meters away. There's your five meter distance. And then you've got an intensity there of 100 watts per meter squared. Then it says, OK, what happens if you double the distance? So you go twice as far out here to this point out here. So that's like a second distance. This is the first distance, and the first intensity. So the second distance is twice as far. What can we say about that second intensity? So I'll have you think about that one, and then we'll pick that up in class. And we will introduce next the decibel scale, which is a logarithmic intensity scale, and then work on some problems.